thank you very much, Nicole. Thanks for having me. Obviously, this is an important issue. You wouldn't be here on Saturday morning, I don't think, if it wasn't an important issue. So, you are probably well aware that the Canadian government is about to legalize recreational cannabis. What does that mean? It means that anybody over the age of 19, 19 and above, uh, can have 30 grams of cannabis. They can consume that cannabis in their residence. And a residence includes house, patio, backyard. Okay. I don't really want to talk about that legalization issue. It's a political hotbed, and uh, I don't want to get into that. I, uh, the reason why I don't want to get into that is because biology doesn't distinguish between legal and non-legal drugs. Okay? Think about that, and if you take nothing away from this talk other than that, I'll be happy. Okay? Biology doesn't distinguish between legal and non-legal drugs. So, I think it is a really confusing time, both for kids and for adults, for parents in particular. I think we are bombarded with media output and media debates about this topic and uh, chapters. I was at chapters a couple days ago and there were four different magazines in the magazine rack that dealt solely with cannabis. And so I think that our kids are getting exposed to an awful lot of uh, information, good and bad. And I think when you see some of, the, some of the, the things in social media, some of the things that they're being exposed to, it's no wonder they're confused. Because here you've got three, uh, you've got two pop stars, an NBA player, and these are people that our kids look up to. And a lot of them are pretty blasé about their cannabis use. And I think that this is contributing to the confusion, contributing to some of the, the normalization of the use of the drug. So what I'd like to do today is to talk about how your kids' brains are developing. So I'm a neuroscientist, so I like to talk about the brain. And I think if we can understand how the brain works, we can understand how drugs of abuse, particularly cannabis, works to kind of derail uh, some of their behavior. I'd like to clear up a few misconceptions about, about cannabis. I can't do it all. There are so many topics uh, when we're talking about cannabis, I can't touch on them all. But I am happy to talk with you afterwards or even um, after this event. I'd also like to talk a little bit about some of the research that I do using MRI, and then just a tiny bit about what we might be able to do for our kids. So our brain. Our brain is amazing. Our brain has over 100 billion neurons, so cells. 100 billion neurons, and that's more than the number of people on this planet. And the complexity doesn't stop there. The complexity continues when you think about each one of those neurons communicating, talking with a thousand to ten thousand other neurons. That's a lot of talking, and it is an incredibly well orchestrated organ, and that communication is key. Those connections are key to a healthy brain. We'll talk more about that in a second. Those connections work by electrical activity and chemical activity. And the electrical activity, so you're sitting here listening to me, there's enough electrical activity in your brain right now uh, to turn on a light bulb. So, I couldn't resist that top picture, <laughs> really. Uh, so, that electrical activity is really important and the connections that uh, that we're talking about are kind of uh, kind of like the wiring in your house. You wouldn't want the wiring in your house to be faulty because then things wouldn't work, right? Uh, or similarly, a highway system. You know how uh, annoying it can be to have an inefficient highway system. 
And so this is kind of like the connections in our brain. We want to maximize those connections. We want them to be as efficient as possible so that we can have successful uh, behavior. So these connections begin to uh, form as early as in utero. So I'm going to take you back a little bit. And so prenatally, our brain goes through seven different stages. The first five are really just getting the neurons uh, sorted out, uh, deciding which one is a visual neuron, which one's a motor neuron, which one is a for this chemical, for that chemical. And then once they're sort of in place, it's amazing. Our brain actually creates more neurons than it needs. And that's just in case there's damage that occurs. So it's a nice way uh, to compensate if there's a problem. And so the sixth stage of prenatal development of the brain is called pruning. And so you have these excess neurons, you don't necessarily need them all, and so the brain prunes them, just like you prune a tree to help with streamlining the growth of the good connections. And then those good connections go through a process called myelination. So that's a big word for basically saying optimizing the communication that goes on between neurons. So there's a fatty tissue that covers neurons and allows for faster communication. So back to our highway system, it takes our, our uh, takes the, the um, speed limit from say 40 kilometers per hour to 100 kilometers per hour. Okay, so much more efficient, get more done. Now, this happens in utero. Your brain obviously still develops as you're, uh, after you're born. And you've probably all heard that our brains don't completely finish developing until early 20s. You've probably heard that. I don't think it's enough to just know that. Because I don't think that that tells the whole story. I think we need to understand why and the mechanisms behind that growth. And so it turns out that in the teen years, our brain goes through another big boost of development and guess what those two uh, two significant really critical phases of development are recruiting and myelination so exactly the same as prenatally except now our brain develops from the back to the front essentially and the front of the brain so the prefrontal cortex in particular which is just above our eyes it's the latest part to develop. And so it's undergoing this pruning and myelination, this streamlining of the connections in the teen years. This is what we're talking about when we say that the brain hasn't completely developed. It's still optimizing. And why is this part of the brain so important? Because it's the prefrontal cortex that helps with our higher order cognition. What does that mean? Decision making. Things like planning. Things like setting a goal and achieving that goal. Setting the steps in place to achieve that goal without getting distracted. So Jimmy has a test on Friday and he needs to study for a couple hours before that. But on Thursday he knows that he can't study because he has a hockey game. And so he can plan ahead and say, okay, Wednesday night I'm going to study for my test on Friday. That's executive function. That's being able to, uh, to use that prefrontal cortex in the way that it should be. And so the prefrontal cortex is kind of like the CEO of your brain, kind of like the, the conductor of the band. And so you need to have solid connections between that part of the brain and the rest of your brain in order to have successful lives, whether it be in relationships or education or job, job uh, really important to have that uh, solid integrity of the prefrontal cortex and its connections with the rest of the brain. 
Now there's another part of this story that's really important with respect to brain regions and development. And that is in our limbic system, or in our striatum. So don't worry about the words, but this is a part of the brain that's a little bit further back. And if you notice, I don't have a pointer, but if you notice that the development uh, is actually quicker in a more curvilinear fashion than the development of the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. So that limbic system that controls or houses our emotions and our reward system is already active and more developed than our thinking brain. So this should probably be resonating a little bit with you uh, because I'm sure, <laughs> so I can tell it is, <laughs> um, because your teenagers often are a bit emotional, huh? Uh, without thinking about their actions. They're after that quick reward without thinking about the consequences of their behavior. And it makes sense if you know about the neurobiology. Because this part of the brain is more developed, it's active, but that thinking brain hasn't caught up yet. And so this is where it's very important when we think about a healthy brain. Things like uh, trauma to the brain, concussion, you think about poor nutrition, bad exercise, or not, not exercising. Uh, to have a healthy brain, you need to develop those connections between the striatum and the prefrontal cortex. And another thing that can hijack that development is kind of it. There you go. <laughs> right, you got it. And so um, we will get back to that. So what the, the question is, and this is the surprising part, I think, what controls that prenatal growth, that pruning and myelination that occurs prenatally, and also in the teen years. And this is where the drum roll comes and the punchline is, because yes, neuroscience can be fun. <laughs> it's our endogenous cannabinoid system, called the endocannabinoid system. Unfortunate name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because the pot enthusiasts tend to say, well, our brains were just made for cannabis. <laughs> not, not the case at all. <laughs> so this endocannabinoid system is phenomenal. We only realized this about 20 to 25 years ago. The endocannabinoid system actually is very widespread across our brains, and it works to regulate an awful lot of our behavior an awful lot of processes in our, our, uh, our bodies and our brain. And it helps to, uh, to balance, to regulate, to create a homeostatic system. It, you'll see that it's, uh, there's receptors, or kind of like a lock and key uh, in, the, in the neurons, uh, in a lot of different parts of our brain. And so one example up there is the hippocampus. And our hippocampus, is uh, it really uh, helps us with learning and memory. Um, also, it helps us with emotion and adding context to situations. And so there's a lot of these lock and key receptors in that part of our brain. And the chemical that our brain makes, the natural chemical that our brain makes, called anandamide, so don't worry, don't worry about that, um, is actually really similar in shape to tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, which is the compound in cannabis that creates the highs, the psychoactive component of cannabis. And they look alike. And so what happens is the THC actually can mimic anandamide and bind and open up those receptors. Now the problem is 
is that our natural cannabinoid system works with very minute amounts of these endogenous cannabinoids, very minute amounts. When exogenous cannabis is consumed, it floods that endocannabinoid system and doesn't allow it to work the way it's supposed to work, affecting all of these behaviors. Okay, so that should be a fairly powerful bit of information for you, that even though we have this endogenous system, exogenous THC really breaks down that natural role that that endocannabinoid system plays. And because of that, lots of different behaviors can be impacted. So I've already mentioned executive functioning, and what we see because of that is a, a lot uh, a lot of problems in schools with attention, with um, making good decisions, uh, but also with more expulsions, less days at school, and uh, less likelihood to graduate from high school and from university. And so uh, it can really sort of hijack that, uh, that progress. That, that leads to future success. The other part of the story, so that cognitive part, we talked about how we need the prefrontal cortex to uh, add that cognitive component or cognitive control to that limbic system. And if that doesn't happen, there's gonna be a problem with things like motivation, things like reward seeking, and things like emotional regulation. And I think this is a really key point. When I talk about uh, the electrochemical uh, connectivity and communication in our brain, I didn't mention the chemical part. Uh, but we need to talk about dopamine. So dopamine is a chemical in our brain, and it's considered a reward chemical. So when you eat your favorite ice cream sundae, you get a surge of dopamine. Uh, when you do something that you really like, you get a surge of dopamine. Our brains are hardwired for reward. It's a really smart thing because we need to do things like eat and drink and, and procreate to help us with survival. So our brains are, are, are hardwired for it, but our brain is not prepared for the surge of dopamine that drugs of abuse cause. So there is a, uh, the, the increase in dopamine that occurs with things like cannabis far greater than anything we get naturally. And this is a problem because sure, it makes you feel good, uh, but after the dopamine goes back down, you want it again, it goes back up, but not quite as high. And then you want it again. And what happens is that that dopamine gets down regulated. And so things that you used to like to do that used to help with your dopamine release, they don't work anymore. So this is where you get kids that used to be really athletic, interested in all kinds of things, and then they become a bit less motivated to do them. And so this is really a, a, an important chemical in our brain. And again, cannabis is hijacking that system. And that then can, uh, yes, they, they feel better for a little bit, but it's going to get worse. And then that's when you find some anxiety, some depression, and you need more of the drug to make yourself just feel normal. So we'll get back to that in a second. And then with the combination of your prefrontal cortex not really connecting very well, not making good decisions, you're going to have risk-taking behavior. And obviously, one good example is driving impaired. Um, you think about the things that cannabis does, it affects reaction time, it affects attention. Driving is going to be impacted. Is it as bad as driving drunk? It's different. There are, 
the, the, the information at the top, cannabis was the most common illicit drug present among fatally injured drivers aged 15 to 24. That should be alarming to you. This is something that the, uh, the Canadian government is having to deal with, the police system is having to deal with, and they're, they're really racing to try to uh, come up with some answers for this. I'm not going to... Uh, we're going to have to keep going, but this is a topic that I think is really important. Okay, so that's your Neuroscience 101. Now I'm just going to uh, address some of these misconceptions, and again, it's not all of them. We've already talked about that first one. Um, the second one is, you know, don't panic, it's organic. <laughs> So my, my only sort of statement to that is uh, poison ivy is natural. I wouldn't want to have anything to do with poison ivy. Okay? That's all I'm going to say. Um, the, the third point here, cannabis is better than alcohol and nicotine. So is it? I don't think it is. I think that it can be just as destructive. Is your child going to get into a ballroom brawl because they're high um, versus being drunk? Probably not, but they could sit on the couch for five days straight because they're high, doing nothing. Okay? So, again, biology doesn't distinguish. These are all drugs of abuse. They all impact the brain the same way. Okay? Everyone is doing it. So, yeah, that's kind of scary to think, right? It's not true. Not everybody is doing it. Not everybody is doing it. There are some stats out there. I don't really like stats that much. They say that 50% of grade 12 have tried cannabis at least once in the last year. Pretty high number but it's about 8% that are using on a regular basis. Regular basis meaning at least once a week. 8%, so that's not everybody. So um, keep that in mind, we'll talk about it again. Um, it's not addictive. You know what? It is. It really is addictive. There is a cannabis use disorder and who gets addicted, you don't know. Right? You don't know your genetic predisposition. You don't know necessarily what perhaps the level of THC is going to be in the drug that you're using. And so the earlier you start, the more chances you are to become addicted to the drug. And the more you use, the more likely. So it's just common sense. But it is an addictive drug. You go through physical and psychological withdrawal if you stop it. And the interesting thing is that it actually develops quicker than alcohol and tobacco dependence. Who knew? Okay. Uh, so cannabis is medicine, so I'll feel better if I use it. I think this is a really tough one. I think this is one of the... the ones that's contributing most to the confusion out there because medical marijuana has been legal in Canada for a number of years and I think that sends a bit of a mixed message. What's important to know here is that there are about 100 different compounds in the cannabis plant. THC is the one that we're talking about with respect to the high but it's CBD or cannabidiol that is the one that has the potential medical benefit. And we, I don't really want to talk about all the research that it, there is out there, but there's not an awful lot. It's a lot of subjective, um, <coughs> subjective reports. Uh, the actual scientific evidence is, is not very sound. It's good for um, pretty solid evidence for um, motor spasticity and MS patients, for nausea, uh, after chemotherapy. Um, so there are a couple places where there's some solid evidence, but not a lot in, in others. And 
it's not the CBD that gives the high. And so the industry knows this. And the industry has been developing strains of cannabis with higher and higher THC levels and lower and lower CBD levels. They want you to get high. They want you to become addicted to it so they're going to have more money. The marketing is turns my stomach, to be honest. I could talk a lot more about this, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but just know that it's not the THC that has the, the medical benefit, and we're still, the jury's still out about the, the CBD. A lot more has to be done. There's potential, I think, but a lot more has to be, has to be done. And then the last point, the research shows mixed evidence. And that's actually uh, sort of true, but if you really dive into the research, uh, you'll see that there's the same common uh, results. And so that's where I come in. So I do MRI research. I use uh, the MRI scanner uh, to do something called functional MRI. So watching the brain as it's working. So I measure blood flow as people are in the scanner doing certain tasks, executive functioning tasks. So seeing how well their prefrontal cortex is working. And I uh, was part of a study called the OPPF, the Auto Prenatal Perspective Study, that started a long time ago and, uh, at Carleton University. And it was a really unique study because the professor started it when women were pregnant. And so some of the women were using pot, some of them were not. And he followed up the families uh, every two or three years doing a bunch of testing with them and has a, a, a really rich sample, uh, lots and lots of information, over 4,000 lifestyle variables collected on these, these people. And what he saw was subtle executive functioning problems in the kids that were prenatally exposed to marijuana. We're not really talking about that, but it makes sense given what we know about the endocannabinoid system and prenatal development, right? Shoot, uh, shoot a little bit further ahead, and some of the kids are starting to use those thoughts. And so I imaged the, uh, a group of these OPPF offspring when they were 19 to 21. We gave them tasks to do while they were in the scanner and watched their brains as they were performing them. And what we saw, and this is similar to an awful lot of other studies, so other studies have replicated this, and what's interesting is that we do see differences in the brains of kids who started using early compared to those that haven't used. What we see is increased brain activity during these executive functioning tasks. So you might say, increased activity? That sounds great. They're, they're, they're doing well. Not so much. They're, what's happening is that they're having to compensate for some underlying problem in their prefrontal cortex. And so they are having to work harder, having to give more energy to perform these tasks. And if you put them into the real world and give them these tasks that are far more complicated than the ones we were giving them in the scanner, that compensation isn't going to allow them to succeed as well. And so this was really showing that, in fact, in use was impacting the functioning of the brain. We also saw some, some subtle structural problems as well. And these were the areas that were really impacted. So we don't know everything there is to know. We don't know how if they stopped what the long-term effects are. There's not solid evidence about that yet. There's not also solid evidence about if you just do, one, do it once in a while. And we don't really know that. These were regular users, at least again, once, once a week, or three years, or more. So we don't know everything, but what we do know, and what the literature consistently reports, is that the problems that we see with cannabis use are related to where in the brain those cannabinoid receptors are, and the behaviors that those areas control. And so 
the biggest thing is executive functioning and emotion regulation, so the connection between that prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. And that the earlier the onset, the more significant the impact. The more they use, and the higher the dose they use, the worse off they are. It makes sense, right? That's, that shouldn't necessarily be surprising. But that is consistent. We know that. If you start early, your brain is going to not be as healthy as if you start later on. So I often will say, you know, I don't care if you do it when you're 50, just don't do it when you're 13. Okay, so those were just some of the misconceptions. Um, I don't really want to get into this too, too much. I'm not a clinician, but uh, some of the reasons why kids are using becomes important, obviously. So they're getting these mixed messages, and I think that feeds these reasons. So one of the biggest ones, I think, is the fact that their risk perception is low. So it's been shown over the years, looking at this, this sort of trajectory of uh, how much people are using, if their risk perception is high, the use is low. If the risk perception is low, the use goes up. Makes sense. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I want you all to go home and talk to your kids about some of these things, because they need to know that there is a risk. They need to know that just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's okay. I think our kids are really stressed out. And stress is the biggest derailer of future success. Really stressed out. And um, when, our, when our brains are stressed, there's no communication between that thinking brain, that prefrontal cortex, and the, and the limbic system. And so there's going to be changes in behavior. Um, so this is how can we tell, I guess I'm not a clinician, but thought you might be interested. And really what's important is changes in behavior. So if there's changes in sleep habits, changes in attitude, changes in friends, these are the sorts of things that you need to pay attention to, okay? Does it mean if they have this that, that they're smoking pot? Doesn't mean that could be that they're just very stressed, because these are a lot of the symptoms of that as well. But if you see this, you want to be asking some questions. If I've totally freaked you out now, and you're totally scared, because you know your child's doing this, think about the brain, think about how it's still developing. There's still hope, right? If we can get them to stop, they're still within this really malleable part of their development. They can still connect, make those good connections. They can still have a healthy brain. Just need to get them to stop. And if you take away the drug, you've got to replace it with something else, right? You've got to you've got to replace that dopamine. Um, and so, lots of different ways of doing that, getting that natural high. Uh, my daughter did a debate in class on Wednesday, and I picked her up, and she got in the car, and I said, hey, how was the debate? And she said, it was the biggest rush of dopamine I've ever had. <laughs> a neuroscientist's dream, right? <laughs> to hear your child talking about dopamine related to schoolwork. I loved it. <laughs> but there's lots of ways to, to replace that drug. I, you have to replace the time that they're spending using that drug, finding that drug, uh, and then also that that uh, reward that they're getting from it. And so here's just a few, you know, uh, using meditation, music, music. You know, it's probably get driven crazy by the music that your kids listen to, but music is a really big source of dopamine. You play music that you love, you're going to get increased dopamine. Think about that the next time you really want to turn off the, the radio. <laughs> Exercise, a great way to have a natural high. We need to get them to, to have a natural, a natural high. Uh, so how can we prevent use if they haven't started using? I think knowledge is power. That's why I'm doing this. Uh, 
we need to have healthy brains to have healthy kids to have healthy families. And we need to listen to our kids. We need to talk to them non-judgmentally. Uh, it is confusing out there. They're being bombarded with information. It would be good to find out what it is they know and what they don't know. And again, this idea of, uh, of getting them something that they love to do, to have that natural high so they don't need to go elsewhere for it. And then mindfulness. So Nicole mentioned that I've implemented some mindfulness um, uh, education programs in schools, and you see the, the power that, that is, uh, is available with that, that tool. Mindfulness, not just for our kids, but for ourselves. So what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is being in the moment, just concentrating on what you're doing right now, not thinking about the future, what you have to do, going to get Jimmy from soccer practice, not thinking about what you should have done, but just being here, being present in the moment. So I thought I would, I, can I do one exercise? So this is really simple, very simple mindfulness tool. We start this in kindergarten. So it's really simple. You can do it when you're in a meeting and your colleagues are driving you crazy uh, and they'll never know you're doing it. Except maybe you'll look a little bit more relaxed. And you can get your kids to do it when they're in class and they're, they're uh, feeling their anxiety level rise. Uh, so you don't have to put your hand up, but um, what I'm going to ask you to do is you have your hand up and uh, you're going to run your index finger of your left hand over your right hand and you're just going to breathe in with every increase and, de and uh, breathe out with every valley. So we're just going to do that and there's a reason why we're doing this. Okay? It's not just to calm me down. <laughs> okay, so we're going to, uh, you can shut your eyes if you want if you're more comfortable doing that and you don't have to. So we're going to breathe in. And breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. One minute. I feel better. <laughs> Took one minute. If you do that every time you're feeling a bit anxious during the day, it's going to improve the way you respond to your kids, the way they respond to stressful situations. Very simple, very easy technique. Your breath goes with you wherever you are. Okay. No, I'm all relaxed. Okay. Um, okay. So I think that this is a really important time. It's the time now where you guys can really influence your children. I think we sometimes mistake uh, physical maturation for psychosocial maturation. Our kids need us, even though they want to go and hang out with their friends. They still need us to be there for. And I think bringing them information uh, in a subtle way um, is, is important. Uh, the um, Drug Free Kids Canada uh, has put out a, a guide about how to talk to your kids about cannabis that I think is really effective. Um, it's on the um, Ottawa Public Health website and I have a link to it in a second. Uh, but I think it's really important to talk, talk to our kids to discuss how it's really important to delay that initiation of use until the brain has fully developed. It really is worth, worth the wait. Uh, it is not a benign substance. It is not a, a harmless substance. And I think they need to know that. And so we can 
help by talking to our kids, by finding that thing that gives them the natural high um, that, that they need to keep them happy and keep them confident about themselves, not looking for other ways of doing that. So we need to increase our awareness, prevention, and resilience. I think the mindfulness can play a role in that resilience factor. And again, remember, biology does not distinguish between legal and non-legal. All right? And so I really believe that a healthy brain means that we have happy kids, which means that we all are happy. Okay? Thank you.